you can probably relate, but I'm, uh, I'm improving, doing much better. Um, so glad to be back. And just a, a note, I think Britta will probably remind everybody uh, at the end, but uh, our next two sessions, session three, will be on uh, February 4th. And then the final session, session four, will be on February 18th. So the Great Riot. I want to cover some aspects of the first few months of the uh, War of American Independence, 1775 to 76. Before I get started, just a note here. Uh, you probably noticed that I like to use things like flags and symbology uh, from the period. Uh, and just a note about this, this right here, uh, covering the drum, that is um, obviously the, the British flag from the area. It's known as the Union flag. Uh, and what you have here is on a background of blue, you have the white cross, diagonal cross of St. Andrew that represents Scotland. And then you have the red uh, cross on, on white background, that's the cross of St. George. And then in 1801, when Ireland became officially part of the United Kingdom, uh, they added uh, the red stripe there, uh, surmounted on the white stripes, and that is the cross of St. Patrick. Uh, each regiment in the British Army, and this was true of, uh, of pretty much all European armies as well as the Continental Army, uh, would have the national colors. In the case of uh, the Continental Army, it would have looked like this, the just known as the Betsy Ross flag. We're all familiar with that with the 13 stars. Uh, but you would have that, uh, the national color. In this case, for Britain, you would have the uh, Union color here, and you would also have a discrete uh, regimental color, and you're going to see several examples of those as we go through the slides. Uh, this happens to be uh, the uh, Union color of the uh, Fourth Regiment of Foot, uh, the King's Own. So um, you'll see this all through uh, the lectures, and I just wanted to point that out because a lot of people are very curious about uh, the flags and, and how I use those. So the Great Riot, second lecture in a four-part series on the War of American Independence. Well, I suspect in Rhode Island area, most of us have uh, been up to Boston area and seen the Minuteman statue, and there it is. Uh, what were the Minutemen? Well, uh, from the old uh, British tradition, basically every adult male was a member of the militia, and that meant that you turned out to drill periodically, and when they say, for example, the Spanish or the French were threatening an invasion, then uh, the monarch would call out the local militia under the command of the Lord Lieutenant of the county. Uh, and this would have been a, a prominent gentry or, or noble person in that county, and, and he would basically command the militia from that county. Well, that transferred over to the colonies, obviously. Um, and so the Minutemen were a small subset of the general militia. They were highly mobile. They were rapidly deployable for an emergency. They typically were your younger men. Uh, obviously, you had to be a little bit more fit. About a quarter of the total militia. And now, for this episode right now, we're talking about uh, clearly the eastern part of Massachusetts uh, militia. Uh, the militia dated all the way back to the 17th century when uh, Massachusetts uh, was first settled and then, of course, Rhode Island, Connecticut uh, as well. Uh, the Minutemen were, came out of a tradition known as the trained bands. And what this was, uh, was in 1573 with the threat of uh, Spanish invasion. This would have been the, uh, the Armada period for those of you that know Elizabethan period. Uh, and uh, Queen Elizabeth realized that basically it was a, just a mob that would show up, some armed, some not armed, not trained or disciplined at all. And so she created in 1573 what was known as the trained bands. And these were select militia units uh, whose function was to be better trained, better equipped, uniformed typically, uh, and, and basically the elite of the uh, county militias. And so this idea transferred over to the colonies in the form of the Minutemen. And so think of these guys that turned out at Lexington Green and Concord uh, in uh, April of 1775. Think of them as the elite of the Massachusetts militia, uh, the best, better trained, better armed, and uh, better able to uh, conduct operations. So let's, let's look at what happened here in April of 1775. 
Well, there is General Thomas Gage. He was the commander of all British forces in North America from 1763 up until his relief in October of 75. Uh, he is the officer, in fact, that ended Pontiac's Rebellion of 1763, if you know anything about um, that period uh, in American history. That was at the tail end of the uh, French and Indian War. Um, and he was based out of Boston with the bulk of the Royal Troops. And I talked last time about uh, the moving of troops in and all the various revenue acts to pay for them that created such uh, discontent in the colonies. Uh, he was promoted to Lieutenant General. Uh, in 1770 while in the colonies. Uh, he returned to Boston in early 1774. And basically his mission, by the time we roll into 1775, is to try to basically tamp down uh, the, the anger and the dissent. And the best way to do that, he thought, was uh, to seize arms and uh, make swift strikes against arms caches basically undercut uh, any rebellious activities ability to uh, to conduct operations as far as the sons of liberty and i talked a little bit about them last time who they were uh, he tried to maintain a careful watch on them. in fact general hugh percy uh, commented on his willingness to let the sons of liberty even remain active he said quote the general's great lenity and moderation serve only to make them more daring and insolent and Gage commented back, he said, well, quote, if force is to be used at length, it must be a considerable one, and foreign troops must be hired, for to begin with small numbers will encourage resistance and not terrify, and will in the end cost more blood and treasure, end quote. And he ab absolutely was right here. So on the night of the 18th of April, 1775, he ordered uh, roughly 700 British regulars drawn from the flank companies, and these would have been the light infantry and the grenadiers. Each infantry regiment, uh, when at full strength, would have had 10 companies of anywhere between 50 and 100 men, and eight of them would be called hat companies. They're just basically your heavy infantry, and then you'd have a company of the light infantry. These were the guys that were the better marksmen, the better uh, uh, troops in, in operating in wilderness areas, and then the grenadiers, and these were the tall guys with the, the miter hat, the bearskin hat that you probably all familiar with. So essentially, uh, they would be brigaded together uh, into a formation drawn from each regiment. So the, uh, the troops that march up, uh, marched up to Lexington and Concord were drawn from the flank companies, the Grenadiers and the Lights. So their orders were to march up to Concord to confiscate the uh, military stores that uh, the British knew had been collected there. But by the way, he, uh, even though he was relieved and brought back home in October of 1775. Uh, he was actually promoted to full general and in home defense against any French or Spanish invasion. Well, what about this expedition that was to go up to Concord and confiscate or destroy this uh, arms collection? Well, there is Lieutenant Colonel uh, Francis Smith. So on the uh, 18th of April, he received sealed orders on the afternoon, and he was ordered uh, to proceed with, quote, utmost expedition and secrecy to Concord, where you will seize and destroy all military stores. But you will take care that the soldiers do not plunder the inhabitants or hurt private property. So, end quote. So very specific um, uh, d directions to uh, uh, Colonel Smith. He was not to order, uh, open the orders until be marching. Uh, so an attempt to maintain some sort of secrecy. What was interesting is in the orders, there was no mention of arresting either John Hancock or John Adams. Uh, basically, General Gage didn't want to inflame the situation by making arrests. His intent in sending this expedition out was just as it stated to confiscate or destroy uh, this uh, arms collection that had been gathered at Concord. However, um, the Patriots had a very good uh, intelligence network, as you probably are aware, and they were completely aware that this was likely to happen. So they had already moved out most, not all, but most of the arms at, at Concord had already been moved elsewhere. Um, and uh, so the, uh, the troops began assembling on Boston Common about 9 o'clock at the water's edge. They were rowed across to Charlestown in barges and began their march to Concord about 2 in the morning on the 19th. 
by rowing across to Charlestown, this is the from the famous Longfellow poem, uh, one if, uh, you know, the Old North Church with the, the lanterns, one if by land, two if by sea. And what this basically meant is if they came across the water to Charlestown and came that way, two lanterns, one lantern if they marched down by way of Dorchester and up. So that's what that meant from the uh, Longfellow poem, the Midnight Ride of Paul Revere. Uh, interestingly enough, the troops uh, on the march, they could hear all the alarms going off. Uh, there was a, quite a, an extensive al alarm and alert system uh, that, the, uh, that the Sons of Liberty had established. And uh, as they arrived towards Lexington Green, they were ordered to prime and load about five in the morning. So they knew it was starting to get serious. Well, here is the famous Paul Revere. Uh, most of the leadership uh, of the Sons of Liberty and the uh, Committees of Correspondence uh, had already left Boston about a week earlier. Uh, but Paul Revere had stayed, and so did uh, Dr. Joseph Warren. And so Warren informed uh, Revere and uh, another uh, messenger, a writer, William Dawes, about 9 o'clock. Uh, that the British were preparing to move by boat to Charlestown and then march to Lexington Concord. And uh, the concern was not so much for the arms uh, and ammunition at Concord. As I said, that had already been pretty well moved out. Uh, but they didn't know that, that the British did not have orders to arrest anybody. So uh, they were very worried about the safety of John Hancock and John Adams. And so that essentially is what uh, caused Revere and Dawes to start riding out to spread the alarm. And their, their actions triggered this alarm and muster, it was called, alarm and muster, which meant that once the alarm went out and began being passed from town to town and village to village, then the Minutemen were to muster. Uh, and in fact, they did do that. Uh, it was a, a system for rapid communications and mobilization. It used drums, trumpets, bonfires, alarm guns. These were the things that the British troops heard as they were marching towards Lexington. So. By the time they arrived at Lexington, it wasn't a real big surprise to see uh, Captain Parker's men, men uh, formed up uh, on the edge of Lexington Common. And eventually, this alarm and muster system did, in fact, result in thousands of local militiamen uh, from as far away as 20 or 30 miles away uh, actually uh, uh, forming up. Not many at Lexington, uh, but certainly by the time uh, the action happened at Concord, uh, there were many thousands of militiamen. Uh, Minutemen already formed up. I, I put this up here just to, to illustrate a few things. Uh, there is a grenadier. I mentioned earlier a grenadier company, one of the flank companies, and there is the famous bearskin hat, which of course is a long-standing tradition. Those of you who've been to London and seen the changing of the guard and Buckingham Palace and all, you uh, you see them, the guardsmen wearing a bearskin uh, hat, which actually that model. Uh, came out of the uh, mid 19th century, but here's what it looked like in the uh, uh, 17th to 18th century. It was a psychological warfare uh, of a sort, because the typical grenadier could be six feet tall or more, uh, and they were specifically recruited for that. Uh, and then you add on a 18 to 20 inch bearskin hat called a miter hat, and now all of a sudden, if you're this five foot two militiaman or soldier conscript from Austria or France or whatever, and you're looking across the battlefield coming at you, these guys looking eight feet tall with the bayonets pointed at you. Think about the psychological warfare aspect of that. Uh, so th there's a reason why uh, grenadiers did wear the, the bearskin or the miter cap. And you'll notice here also, even though uh, they no longer carried the grenades, uh, which their original function in the 17th century was to run up to an enemy fortification, light the grenade from a match, there's their match case right there, and toss it in the fortifications. Well, as you might imagine, casualties were somewhat high. So the function of the grenadiers is to actually toss these grenades uh, went away pretty quick, but all the European armies retained the, the concept of, uh, of the very tall men in the tall uh, bonnets or, or miter hats uh, as a psychological warfare aspect. Uh, over here, you have uh, an officer of the 42nd Royal Highland Regiment, the Black Watch, uh, and uh, obviously very Scottish looking. So that's just um, a look at some of the participants here from the British side. All right, the shot heard around the world. So we're now into the 
early morning of the 19th of April. Uh, about three in the morning, uh, Colonel Smith sent Major Pitcairn of the Royal Marines ahead uh, on the quick march with six companies of the Light Infantry uh, to go to Lexington Green. And this set in motion essentially uh, the flashpoint, if you will, uh, the uh, shot heard around the world. I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment here. So uh, within a few minutes, three companies of the lights arrived on Lexington Green and formed up. Uh, the main body of the British troops were still uh, back down the road towards Cambridge. By the way, um, I use a lot, uh, those of you who've seen my lectures in the past, you know I like to use a lot of what I call heroic art uh, in the age before photography. Uh, you will get these paintings or uh, diagrams, uh, maps, and that sort of thing that depicted action, and usually it was very heroic looking, uh, completely unrealistic, but the idea was this was how you express to the public uh, images of what actually happened. So how accurate is this? Well, not at all, uh, but it still would capture the image of the British regular troops on Lexington Green, and here you see the uh, militia with some casualties down uh, actually fleeing. And speaking of photographs, I've used this joke many times before. It probably doesn't work anymore, but I'll use it again. So here we have an actual photograph from Lexington Green on that morning in April 1775. Now, if this were live, I would hear a lot of laughter and guffaws and applause and what have you, but can't wait till we get back to live audience. Well, um, those reenactors, by the way, uh, they're uh, reenacting the 10th Regiment of Foot, uh, which actually participated that that original regiment uh, was a part of the formation. And here are the musicians, you see. Uh, there's the light infantry, and there's the grenadiers. So about 80 Lexington militiamen uh, exited the Buckman Tavern, which, by the way, is still there. Uh, and they lined up on the commons under Captain John Parker. Uh, they were, of course, the trained band, uh, not technically the straight stick militia. Uh, legend says that uh, Captain Parker said, quote, stand your ground. Don't fire unless fired upon, but if they mean to have a war, let it begin here. Uh, probably never said that, but like a lot of uh, heroic legendary uh, quotations, uh, somebody attributed that to Captain Parker. Another legend was that uh, Major Pitcairn fired the first shot. Um, Maybe yes, maybe no. Uh, what we do know is that one of the officers uh, in the British formation rode forward and ordered the, um, the militiamen to disperse. He ordered them to lay down your arms, you damned rebels. Uh, at that point, Captain Parker actually ordered the men to depart, uh, but none laid down their arms. So at least initially, it looks like the situation was uh, somewhat diffused. And then something happened. Um, both Parker and Major Pitcairn ordered their men to hold the fire, and then a shot came from some unknown source. Uh, traditionally, legend says it was Major Pitcairn. Uh, I don't believe that for a second. I mean, after all, he had just ordered his men basically to stand down to hold their fire. Uh, why would he pull out a pistol and fire a shot? The, most historians believe it actually was a, um, a shot from the second floor of the Buckman Tavern, uh, other witnesses uh, recorded that it came variously from behind a hedge or around the corner of the tavern. Uh, all kinds of reports. It's kind of like uh, President Kennedy assassination. Everybody thought they heard something or saw something different. Uh, but whoever fired it, the upshot was, as you see here, uh, it started sporadic firing on both sides. Uh, the militia fled, uh, particularly when the uh, uh, the British forces fixed bayonet and started advancing on them. Uh, some casualties, eight were killed and 10 were wounded in the melee. Uh, one soldier, the 10th, was actually wounded. So uh, th it was a bad, bad day for the uh, Massachusetts militia. So at that point, um, Colonel Smith arrived with the rest of the main body and they began the march uh, from Lexington Common uh, along this road here, there's Lexington Common, Buckman Tavern, towards the ultimate target, which was Concord, and specifically uh, Barrett's Farm there. That's where it was suspected that a lot of the uh, uh, arms and, and ammunition were, were uh, stashed. 
uh, just to orient you uh, geographically, there's South Bridge and there's North Bridge, and I'll, uh, I'll have much to say about that shortly. So by about this time, 250 militia had gathered, assembled in Concord to intercept. Um, they realized the, the strength of the British formation as it approached, so they marched back out of town um, and stayed uh, about 500 yards ahead of the British uh, uh, column. Now, remember in those days with smoothbore musketry, uh, if you can hit a target that you actually aim at at 100 yards, you can, you're doing very well. So as long as they stayed a few hundred yards away, there was no danger of being fired upon. Uh, Colonel James Barrett, I mentioned his farm here. Um, he led the uh, militiamen, and they, they actually abandoned the town uh, down here and went across the North Bridge back towards his farm. Uh, but by this time, militiamen were arriving, not just the Minutemen now. These were regular militia, among others. Uh, all began arriving uh, at that position. So uh, the 10th Regiment of Foot, the Grenadiers, secured that South Bridge. The, uh, the lights were sent up to secure the North Bridge, and they began the search of the town and Barrett's farm, looking for weapons and powder. Didn't find a whole lot that they expected, but they did find, interestingly enough, three 24-pounder cannons buried underneath a tavern. And so they dug this up and set the carriages on fire, uh, burned the carriages. Well, a, a cannon's not very useful if it can't be transported, and so if you burn the carriage, it basically becomes useless. Um, 550 pounds of musket balls were actually uh, tossed into a mill pond, so they did find that. Uh, then the troops uh, began going into the various taverns or whatever and buying food and drink, and uh, it was all very civil. In fact, the, uh, the locals were directing the British as to where the militiamen weren't. <laughs> so, but it was such a, a uh, uh, relaxed, if you will, atmosphere at this point that um, uh, they were able to get away with it and, uh, and misdirect the searchers away from actual caches of weapons and uh, locations, if you will. Uh, the meeting house uh, actually caught fire uh, from the burning of the gun carriages, and the troops formed a bucket brigade along with the townsfolk uh, to actually put it out. So at this point, uh, everything seemed to be going fairly smoothly. Well, what happened? Uh, Barrett's troops, remember now, they've gone across the, uh, the, the bridge, the North Bridge. They're on the other side which actually is over here where you see the, the statue, they saw the smoke and assumed that the town had been set afire. And so they began to march back towards town and took up a position uh, near the North Bridge. Now, this is where it really got ugly because uh, two companies of British troops, here you see the light infantry troops, uh, about 100 men or so uh, had been sent to secure the bridge. And by this time, there were well over four or 500 militia that had come from Acton, from Concord, from Bedford, from Lincoln. So basically all the, the adjoining towns and villages. Um, and at this point, uh, everyone was doing the Mexican standoff, if that's a term I can use. Um, there were troops uh, came back across the bridge and took up position on this side. So here you have the, the, the Patriot Minutemen militia standing on this side and you see the, uh, the British lights on this side. At this point, uh, youth, inexperience, uh, and bad tactical decision-making set in. Uh, the young officer that was in command of the British troops um, basically lost control of the situation. Uh, firing, sporadic firing began. Uh, a couple of the militiamen were hit uh, and killed, some wounded. Uh, straggling fire. Uh, the militia returned fire. Several of the officers and, and non-commissioned officers were hit. Uh, and once this happened, uh, anyone who's been in the military knows uh, how quickly a situation can go bad when you lose your on-the-scene leadership. And that's essentially what happened. You got to remember that these troops, uh, British troops, even though they were well-trained, well-drilled, uh, they were inexperienced. Um, few of them, except some of the older non-coms, had ever been in combat in the previous war. Uh, and so they essentially a panic, and they fled, abandoning their wounded. Uh, Barrett regained control, uh, marched back into town. Um, and at this point, uh, by mid-afternoon, there were over 2,000 militia uh, 
in Concord. And uh, in fact, uh, Colonel Smith was wounded uh, in the thigh. Uh, many officers were, uh, were wounded, many casualties. And at this point uh, began the uh, horrendous retreat from Concord, which you see depicted here in this, uh, this water. Uh, it, I think it's about 18 miles or so from Concord back into, uh, well, it would all be the, the environs of Boston now, but uh, at that time it would have been just the small villages. But back along this single road, and uh, the militia would run up behind a fence. In fact, you can see portrayals of them here and there, uh, take a shot and retreat back. Uh, one of the big mythologies of the war is that all the militia were armed with rifles, and that is just not the case. They had the same type of weapons, the smoothbore muskets or hunting pieces or fowling pieces. The, uh, the rifle was very expensive, uh, very rare, and typically you see that along the frontier. And particularly when you get to the war in the south, uh, where these people are primarily uh, living in the back country, the frontier, they do tend to have rifles, but not at Lexington Concord. Uh, but even so, if you run up and if you get as close as depicted here and you fire into a mass of troops marching, you're going to inflict some casualties. Well, the retreat kept going until finally General Percy came up with reinforcements later in the day, uh, but horrendous casualties on, on the British side. Uh, totally unexpected, uh, but clearly rebellion had broken out and it had become very violent. So. What do you do if you're General Gage and you are the British commander and now you've got a full-scale rebellion on your hands and you have to take care of it? Well, the militia kept pouring in. And in fact, about 15,000 militia, mostly Massachusetts by this time, Rhode Island and Connecticut uh, militia starting to arrive. And a force of about 15,000 surrounded and blockaded Boston and controlled all the land access. So, uh, on the 12th of June, so we're now a couple months down the road, uh, General Gage offered a complete pardon who all, to all who would lay down their arms, except for John Adams and John Hancock. Uh, that didn't go over well. Uh, so inside Boston, 6,000 British troops, uh, the Royal Navy provided logistics, um, but they were surrounded, uh, at least from the landward side. Now. In May, three officers arrived that are going to play a huge part in the story to come. William Howe, John Burgoyne, and Henry Clinton. And I'll have much more to say about all three of these officers who arrived in late May with reinforcements. So the plan, the British plan, was actually to go across to Charlestown to fortify Bunker Hill uh, and the Dorchester Heights. Uh, and the idea was to basically do a double envelopment or a pincer movement on the, uh, the militiamen to force them to retire, and that would uh, break the blockade. And here you see uh, Bunker, or more appropriately, it was Breed's Hill. I'll show you a map shortly. Uh, this is a, uh, a famous painting, The Death of General Warren. There you see him there. Um, this is a good example of what I call the heroic art. And you can see why I call it that. Uh, this is apparently the depiction of the final assault, the third assault of the British forces uh, as they actually went over the top of the uh, fortifications. Now, note this gentleman right here. Uh, that is uh, Ensign, uh, the Right Honorable uh, Lord Francis Rowden, later Earl of Mora and later Marquess of Hastings. He's going to play a huge role in the uh, Southern Campaign, but that is him right there carrying the colors of uh, the 5th Regiment of Foot. So there is the map. Here's Boston itself. Uh, this is the waterway that I mentioned earlier where they actually crossed the longboats. Breed's Hill, Bunker Hill. Uh, most of the fighting was actually against Breed's Hill, and there you see the, the road going around and the fortification there at the top of the hill. Uh, I'm not sure exactly where uh, it got confused. There, there were fortifications on Bunker Hill, but most of the, the battle was actually fought for Breeze Hill. Uh, but we all know it is the Battle of Bunker Hill. So what happened? Well, on the 16th of June, intelligence was received uh, by the uh, Patriot Militia that the British intended to occupy that high ground. I mentioned the Dorchester Heights, which was way down here, uh, but also specifically Breeze Hill and Bunker Hill. Uh, and so uh, Artemis Ward, 
uh, ordered Israel Putnam, two famous names from the period, to fortify uh, Breed's Hill. And uh, Colonel William Prescott, another famous name, took 1,200 men in at night and actually constructed the works on Breed's Hill. Now, that made it within artillery range of Boston itself here. And that could not, uh, that could not stand. What they built overnight was a 130-foot square earthen redoubt. Now, redoubt is basically you go in, you dig out a trench, and use that dirt to build a, a wall, and you usually fortify it with uh, logs or whatever uh, so that if anyone's attacking you, they have to go down through the trench and come up over the wall. That's a redoubt. Uh, and then they built six-foot-high uh, firing wooden firing platforms. So it was a pretty stout defensive position. So what happened? Well, HMS Lively, a uh, ship, British uh, Royal Navy ship, opened fire on the works about four in the morning, uh, and a general bombardment of the uh, Royal Navy ships in the harbor, but really didn't do a whole lot of damage. So at this point, a Gage ordered uh, uh, actually a frontal assault. Um, so they started bringing the troops across to Charlestown, uh, from Charlestown in the longboats. It took about six hours to get all the troops across. So in the afternoon is when the action occurred. What this allowed was the militia to bring in a lot more reinforcements across the, the Charlestown neck here, uh, up to Bunker Hill and up to Breed's Hill. So uh, by the time the British forces formed up here and here for a flanking maneuver, uh, there were uh, quite a number of militiamen already there. Well, I'm not going to go through the, the uh, nuts and bolts of the battle. Uh, there's some excellent works on that um, that you can read. Uh, if I did that for every major event, I don't, we would never get through it. But um, uh, you can see there basically the, the movements. Here was the frontal assault. They actually made three assaults on the Breed's Hill. Uh, and then uh, there was a flanking attack that uh, tried to get behind them. There is another um, not very accurate depiction, but you get the idea. There's the, the line, the linear formations going up the hill against the, uh, the assault. Horrendous casualties. Um, the British had 226 killed in action, 828 wounded, many of whom were officers. Uh, the uh, Patriot militia, 140 killed, 280 wounded, and 30 captured. Uh, pretty horrendous casualties. And what the lesson here for the British was that this was going to be more than just a civil uprising, a rebellion. Uh, it was a full-scale war. The lesson for the Patriots was that, well, militia can stand up to well-trained, well-disciplined British regulars. A false assumption, as, as they're going to find out pretty quickly. Uh, nonetheless, that was the lesson that, that came away from that. I mentioned the flags earlier. Um, there's a good example of the regimental color. That's actually the 23rd Royal Welch Fusiliers. Uh, and there's the 10th Regiment of Foot. There's our colors. And there's, of course, uh, the, uh, uh, the King's color, the Union color. Now, I know that many of us remember uh, the far side, the cartoon. This is my all-time favorite. You've got to look very carefully at this one. I'll read the uh, narration, but look very carefully at the drawing from the far side. Bunker Hill, June 17, 1775. An unfortunate twist of fate for one young redcoat, Charles Bug-Eyed Bingham, was not knowing that the opposing American general had just uttered the historic command, don't fire until you see the whites of their eyes. I love that cartoon. Alrighty. Well, there is, interestingly enough, uh, an historic map of Boston. Uh, what a lot of people find amazing, I think Logan Airport is somewhere over here. Now, that was Boston at the time. I mean, imagine that little bit of Boston today, but that's what it looked like. There's, of course, Charlestown. So the siege of Boston. Uh, Bunker Hill, even though the militia were driven off the hill, uh, the British were unable to fortify it and retreated back to uh, Boston. Uh, and the siege of Boston basically went uh, for almost a year until mid-March 1776. Uh, the militia lines uh, in the blockade, if you will, extended all the way from Chelsea to Roxbury. Uh, 
uh, which I guess are both uh, par portions of modern day Boston. By this time, militia is pouring in not only from other parts of Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New Hampshire, uh, and General Gage is recalled to London and General Howe becomes the commander in chief. Well, there were things going on elsewhere. And one of the things I want to highlight here is the taking of Fort Ticonderoga. If you've never been to upstate New York to see Fort Ticonderoga, I most highly recommend it. It's, uh, they've restored it. It's, it's a wonderful program there that they do uh, and uh, it's well worth the trip. Well, what happened? Uh, a force under Benedict Arnold, there you see him portrayed, uh, and Ethan Allen also portrayed there. They captured Fort Ticonderoga and Crown Point. This was the 10th of May. Well, it really wasn't much a, a, of an exercise, if you will. There was a lone sentry who was surprised. I think there were only about 25 troops there. Uh, but what they did was they captured 180 cannon plus a large warship. Uh, Ethan Allen uh, was leader of the Green Mountain Boys. And uh, this was a, uh, a actually a, a militia unit um, that uh, was fundamental in creating the state of Vermont in 1791. Uh, at this point, at this time, what is now modern day Vermont was largely part of the uh, colony of New York. But there you see a portrayal of, uh, of uh, Ethan Allen demanding the uh, surrender of the fort in the name of the great Jehovah and the Continental Congress. Well, this was fundamentally important because one thing militia do not have, their regulars do, is artillery, cannon. Now they have the complete battery of Fort Ticonderoga. And here we introduce this gentleman, Major General Henry Knox. He was a 25-year-old Boston bookseller. He really had no practical military experience, but he was a great reader. So he had read all the great volumes of military history and military science, etc. So he was created when the new Continental Army uh, formed up that summer of 75. He was made Major General of Artillery. And George Washington, I'll, I'll introduce him shortly, uh, who was commander in chief of the Continental Army by this time, uh, sent him up to uh, Ticonderoga to bring the artillery back to Boston. And that was the famous trek, the guns to Boston. Took them about four months to get them there. Um, over a lot of snow, they, uh, they used oxen and mules to, to drive through. But eventually they got to Boston and they arrived in late January of 1776. Now, the heavy guns from Fort Ticonderoga were set up on the Dorchester Heights in early March. And in fact, the first bombardment of Boston began on the 2nd of March. Uh, Knox commanded this. Little damage was done, but the point was made. Uh, and that was that uh, all the ships in the harbor, Royal Navy ships, and the city of Boston itself could be bombarded uh, from the Dorchester Heights. And you could not do what's called counter battery. In other words, you couldn't fire back because the Dorchester Heights here, the guns could only be elevated a certain angle and they couldn't get elevated enough to send shot up. And this is the point where the British essentially decided to evacuate. Uh, so General Howe chose to evacuate. He uh, took quite a number of loyalists and all the troops and the ships up to Halifax, Nova Scotia. Uh, this was about 10 March. And so um, they evacuated. And at this point, um, essentially, uh, the uh, new Continental Army looks like it's won a huge victory, certainly a huge psychological victory. They forced the British regulars out of Boston. Well, what about uh, General George Washington, Commander in Chief, Continental Army? That's a famous uh, painting of him. I think Peel did that one, but I'm not positive. Uh, but there you see him in his Continental Army uniform. Uh, he had been a prominent officer in the, uh, the Virginia Regiment in the uh, French and Indian War. Uh, he was a delegate from Virginia to the Continental Congress, the Second Continental Congress. And as the Continental Army was being formed up out of volunteers and militia, and Congress had to appoint a commander-in-chief. Well, George Washington, delegate from Virginia, tended to show up for meetings of the Continental Congress in his uniform, his Virginia Regiment uniform. 
And so, well, why not? The, the real story here is John Adams and Hancock and, and folks from the Northeast uh, specifically wanted a Southerner to command so as to pull the South into. Thus far, very little had happened uh, other than just a local protest in the Southern colonies. But by bringing in George Washington from Virginia, uh, this essentially was seen as a way to unite the the uh, colonies in common cause. And so uh, in the summer of 1775, essentially the Continental Army was formed up. Here you see a, a drawing of, uh, of Washington taking command. He arrived in Boston in July, and he brought with him troops from Maryland, Virginia, and Pennsylvania, and also riflemen from the frontier. So by appointing Washington, uh, very clearly, uh, he was bringing in the Southerners and the frontiersmen. One of the first actions of Washington was to detach uh, troops of the Continental Army uh, under uh, Generals Montgomery and Benedict Arnold uh, for an invasion of Canada. And I'll wrap up tonight with uh, the invasion of Canada, a couple things to say about it. Uh, but I have other things first before I get to that. So in early March, um, now you have uh, troops forming up on the Dorchester Heights. You have guns, and the decision was made uh, to evacuate. Well, a little bit about the Continental Army as it formed up. Uh, you often see them portrayed in these very nice, neat uniforms, and they look just like their British compatriots, except uh, they're wearing blue. Very, very few Continental units ever had anything remotely approaching a uniform. Uh, typically, they would wear what they came with. So here you have a frock coat, uh, hunting coat, uh, typically made of linen, for summertime or warm weather uh, or linen for the summer. Uh, here is a, a woodsman's type of outfit. This is more typically what they would have looked like. But some regiments did have formal uniforms. Uh, one of the things that the uh, Continental Congress did is they identified units by colony or soon to be state by the facing color. Facings are the collar, um, the lapels here, the cuffs. And they designated for uh, regiments uh, from New England as white facings, buff color, which would have been what you see here for New York and New Jersey, red for Pennsylvania, De Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, and light blue for North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia. One of the reasons why in the age of linear warfare where fighting had to be very close simply because of the dynamics of the weaponry, very close range, with all the smoke from black powder, and if you've ever been to a battle reenactment, of which there are hundreds of them around, if you've ever been to one, you realize how quickly the whole battlefield is obscured with, uh, with black powder smoke. You have to have some ways of identifying your unit and maintaining that unit cohesion. So that's why things like uh, buttons and lace patterns on, on uniforms and facing colors are, are so, and colors, uh, flags are so fundamentally important. Uh, it's, it's a way of maintaining your unit cohesion. Now, what was the British reaction to the Continental Army? Well, uh, a lot of them were seen as uh, scoundrels and mercenaries. And here's an interesting report. This is a loyalist, Dr. Birkenhout, uh, was sent out in 1778 uh, to take a look at the Continental Army uh, while they were at, um, at Valley Forge. Here's what they said, he said. They are not as they have been represented, a respectable body of yeomanry, but a contemptible body of vagrants, deserters, and thieves. Uh, and many of the Brits regarded the Continental Army as just that, mercenaries, uh, primarily from Ireland and other places that were just simply fighting, fighting for pay uh, or money. And what they totally missed here was that these men, most of them were not doing that. They were fighting for concepts uh, of the rights of free Britons, uh, and liberty, and they, that was very important. Uh, typically, a Continental Army soldier might go months and months and months and months without being paid. Uh, so uh, they were not mercenary at, at all. And one of the things about the Continental Army, first couple of years, they pretty much got their head handed to them anytime they came up against British regulars. But over time, really by about 1779, 1780, you begin to see the Continental Army units. Now they've had some experience, some battle experience, some cohesion, some training, uh, and they actually become uh, as good as the British regulars. 
uh, they can stand toe to toe. Uh, so uh, the evolution and maturation of the uh, of the Continental Army. I want to take a little slight diversion here and talk about from the British side and the role of some key personnel, mainly because of how they reacted to Lexington, Concord, and Bunker Hill. And one of the great uh, myths of the war was, well, King George should have done this, King George should have done that. And I try to tell my students, no. Uh, basically, coming out of the 17th century uh, and, and the, uh, the English Revolution, the British Civil Wars, the monarch had very constricted actual constitutional powers. Real power was vested in the elected legislature, that would be parliament, uh, and the cabinet. Uh, the administrators. So uh, even though the king exercised typically operational control over the military uh, through the cabinet, through the ministries, through the secretary at war, the secretaries of state, et cetera, et cetera, um, he didn't actually command the troops. In fact, the, the last uh, British monarch to actually command in the field was his grandfather, George II. Um, he was a great believer in the domino theory. And this explains in large measure why the decision was made to crush the rebellion by brute military force. Because I think a lot of us remember back to the Vietnam War period and the, uh, the uh, domino theory. And that's that, that if you let one go, just like a row of domino, dominoes, they start going. And the concern was, well, if you let the North American colonies rebel and get away with it. What about West Indies, which actually were economically far more valuable? What about Ireland? And so uh, the idea, typically you crush a revolt, like the Jacobite revolts, Bonnie Prince Charlie and all that, for those of you familiar with that period, uh, it, it, it was decided that you would bring down the heavy hand. So that's King George's attitude, and it pretty much prevailed throughout. But then his chief minister, not really prime minister, that's more of a 19th century title, uh, but basically one of the ministers that was considered the, the chief, hence prime minister, and that in this case would be Lord Frederick North, uh, later Earl of Guilford. He was a great manager of parliament. Uh, he could get bills through for the government, uh, but he was a terrible war leader. Um, and in fact, he tried to resign uh, a couple of three times, telling the king, I'm not the man to direct this war effort. Unlike William Pitt, you remember I talked about him last time and how effective he was at crafting British strategy and directing the forces in the previous war, uh, North was not that man. Um, he understood his limitations. He requested several times to resign. Uh, and here's one of the things that he said about himself, that the war required one directing minister who should plan the whole operations of government and control all the other departments of administration so far as to make them cooperate zealously and actively with his designs, even though contrary to their own. And so Lord North realized he was not the man to be able to do that. Here, however, is the man and the shat, Lord George Germain, uh, Secretary of State for America. And you remember I, I talked about last time I believe the secretaries of state, there were, there were three of them. Well, Lord George Germain was secretary of state for uh, America, uh, and therefore uh, suppressing the rebellion came under his bailiwick. Uh, he was noted for his administrative ability, um, but he was rather a bit obtuse. Uh, he, he saw his role as leaving strategy and operations to the commanders in the field and gave very little strategic direction until late in the war, and then it became contrary to what actually had to happen. Uh, so if you had to point to any one individual failing, I call him the single point of failure. From the British side, it would have to be Lord George uh, Germain. Well, another point of failure uh, is this gentleman, John Montague, the Earl of Sandwich, first Lord of the Admiralty. Now, the Admiralty, um, tried to remain independent. It, it had been around for quite a while, unlike uh, the, the British Army. Uh, and they saw themselves as basically separate from the government, a uh, common kind of entity unto their own. Well, Montague, uh, Lord Sandwich, he was the, f the ideal first lord for this. 
Uh, he would go so far as to actually lie to the cabinet about the readiness state of the Royal Navy, uh, about the numbers, the resources. Uh, he jealously guarded the independence of the Navy. And what this meant is you had the Army working in one direction, the cabinet working in one direction, the field commanders working in another direction, and the Army and the Navy going in opposite directions. Uh, so I think it's largely personality driven here. Now, um, if this were live, I would ask at this point, um, what is it that you should remember about John Montague, Earl of Sandwich? Maybe I'll get a hand or two. Yes, this is where the term sandwich comes from because he was a gambler. He would play cards hour after hour after hour. So what he had was a servant who would take some slab of meat, pork or beef or something, put it between a couple of pieces of bread, sandwich would hold out his hand with his cards in the other hand, the servant would slap the sandwich in and sandwich would eat so he didn't have to stop playing cards. That's where sandwich comes from. Uh, well, speaking of the Navy, I need to mention the birth of the United States by God Navy, 1775. Uh, I'll talk more about naval action, particularly when I get to the Southern Campaign, but I just wanted to at least highlight uh, that the United States Navy, uh, the Continental Navy, actually came about very early. Uh, and there you see the sloop Providence. There's a painting and there's a, a photograph there of the uh, reconstructed one. Well, Rhode Island was an early example of trying to raise naval forces, uh, state naval forces. And the idea was to uh, basically confound the British uh, attempts at blockade, to end smuggling. I think I mentioned last time, uh, if I didn't, I will now, that uh, about 90% of all the arms and particularly gunpowder and flints for the Continental Army actually came in, smuggled in from France. And so uh, the, the role basically of the, uh, the new Continental Navy and the state navies was to do everything they could to flummox any British blockade. So here's one of the early examples, the uh, Sloop Providence. Uh, Rhode Island Assembly funded uh, a ship, they purchased a ship called the Katy in October 1775 to counter the Royal Navy patrols and then renamed it uh, the Sloop of War Providence. And so when you hear the birthplace of the United States Navy is Rhode Island, Newport, Rhode Island, that is exactly it, because Rhode Island was the first to really raise a, a state navy. These small ships, as you might imagine, could not take on the larger British warships, but they, they certainly could confound the blockade. Uh, there is a photo of that reconstructed Providence. She was built uh, in the 1970s. I think she was damaged in a, a nor'easter at some point. She's now in a museum down in Alexandria, Virginia. So if you're ever down that way and want to see it, go for it. Well, I'm going to skip ahead here a little bit uh, to the Battle of Valcor Island, uh, 11 October 1776. This was the first significant U.S. naval engagement against British forces. Uh, Sir Guy Carleton, who commanded in Canada, attempted to move down the, the lakes in New York towards New York itself. Uh, Benedict Arnold, you're going to see him pop up a lot, constructed a flotilla of gunboats and Champlain near the uh, Valcourt Island. Um, they fought an engagement. Uh, the, the Patriot Navy was defeated pretty badly, but the point was, the main point was after this, Carlton uh, recalled his troops, recalled his ships, uh, and so this move by the British to move down the lakes and basically cut off New England from the middle colonies uh, failed. Now there is a painting of um, typical of, of Arnold's gunboat navy, uh, one of which was the Philadelphia. She was sunk at Valcour Island, but she uh, was actually found and raised a number of decades ago, and she's now and has been for a long time on display in the Smithsonian Museum of American History. So if you ever get back down to uh, DC and you go to the Smithsonian Museum of American History, you can actually see uh, the remains of one of these gunboats that fought at the Battle of Valcour Island. Well, here you have the most famous of all Continental Navy officers, John Paul Jones, um, considered the father of the United States Navy. He was a Scot. He was a merchant sea captain. He emigrated to North America about 1774 or thereabouts. And he very early on was commissioned as an officer in the, the new Continental Navy. Um, he had an interesting career. Uh, 
he engaged in pretty bold commerce interdiction all the way across the Atlantic uh, to the British Isles and actually raided some coastal towns uh, in, uh, in Britain. Uh, he also uh, engaged frigate-type frigate Royal Navy warships. Now, a frigate in those days was not a ship of the line, so it would not form up in the, the line-ahead battle line. Uh, but frigates would do things like uh, scouting, small ship actions, blockade duty, that sort of thing. And they typically would have in the range of, say, 20 to 40 guns. Uh, so pretty powerful, but um, uh, uh, certainly not a ship of the line. Well, uh, John Paul Jones' most famous engagement was in 1779. Uh, he, uh, he had a ship supplied by the French, the Bonhomme Richard, or translated to the Good Richard, which was named after uh, uh, Benjamin Franklin's Poor Richard's Almanac. And so Jones and the Bonhomme Richard came up against HMS Serapis, which was a more or less comparable frigate. Uh, there is another famous line, when asked to surrender, Jones replied, I have not yet begun to fight. Probably never stated, or not stated that way, but it uh, has been uh, come down in history uh, as a famous, famous expression. Uh, certainly a great heroic, inspirational story. Now, this is the way the French and the Americans looked at John Paul Jones. The British viewpoint of John Paul Jones, somewhat different. I uh, want to mention this gentleman, Lord Barrington. Uh, and for any of you that live in Barrington, Rhode Island, guess what? This is where that comes from. Uh, he was the Secretary at War. And uh, an interesting thing about the Secretary at War, this was not a cabinet level position. It was more responsible for logistics and manning and resources and whatever. Uh, and yet he probably had the closest to a good idea strategically as to how to deal with these rebellious, uh, uh, rebellious colonies. So I want to show you uh, his plan. He, the, we would just call it the Barrington plan. And the idea was to not have actual troop operations in the colonies, basically to choke them off to concentrate the forces up in Canada and in East Florida, uh, and then impose, use these bases to impose a strict naval blockade and basically, I guess, starve them out, or at least uh, undercut the economy uh, of, the, um, of the rebellious colonies till they saw the true light and came back to allegiance. Well, the problem with this uh, was not only are you hurting uh, all those in rebellion, but you're hurting the neutrals, which will tend to cause them to go against you, and certainly you're hurting the loyalists, which uh, by this time were probably about an equal number to the, to the ardent patriots or those wanting independence. And so uh, you had to be very careful. So Lord Barrington's plan was, was rejected. Another plan that came about, and we're not exactly sure who was the originator of this plan, uh, but it was essentially an enclave strategy. And that was very similar in the sense that you establish your your operating bases in the north and the south, but you go into areas of high concentration of loyalists. And so that would have been uh, the New York area, the Hudson Valley area, very heavily loyalist. Uh, Georgia, at that time, South Carolina. This map needs to really be redrawn because this area of North Carolina and also this area were very heavily loyalist. Um, so the idea is to go into these protected enclave areas, and the theory being that folks outside the area can look in and say, what, you know, my neighbor Tom is doing very, very well, and I'm out here struggling to make a living. Maybe I'll just sign the oath of allegiance and to, to hell with this independence stuff. Uh, this was rejected as well. And so what they ended up with was the Great Riot, or phase one. I'm going to uh, put this up uh, periodically uh, just to show you what the idea was of this, this phase one of say 1775, 76. And the idea was to undercut the leadership, cut off their resources in New England uh, by blockade, prevent any foreign interference. And the what we call the theory of victory, this is your concept of how you're gonna win. Brute force suppresses rebellion and restores allegiance, even if coerced. So in this period I'm talking about tonight, we'll call it phase one, the great riot phase. That was how British authorities, both military and civil came to a conclusion that this was the way to put down the rebellion, as you had always done, by brute military force, round up the ringleaders, 
and end of rebellion. Well, let me finish up here uh, with a few words about the Continental Congress. So I talked about last time the second or first Continental Congress uh, that met in uh, 1774 uh, in Philadelphia. Well, now after uh, Bunker Hill and Lexington Concord, you have the second Continental Congress coming together. Uh, and this is the famous one, um, 10 May 1775. And they are, in essence, a de facto continental government, continental meaning all of the, uh, the colonies combined, to make treaties, to raise armies and navies, conduct foreign policy. Um, Benjamin Franklin represented Pennsylvania. Uh, John Hancock came from Massachusetts. He was actually elected president of the Continental Congress. Thomas Jefferson arrived from Virginia. Um, Georgia actually did not send a delegation initially, but by the summer of 1775, uh, they were on board. This is the body that actually appointed George Washington to command um, the Continental Army. And this is the body that um, uh, issued the declaration by the representatives of the United Colonies of North America, now met in Congress at Philadelphia, setting forth the causes and necessity of their taking up arms. So one of the big functions, if you will, of the Continental Congress was to try to justify what was clearly an illegal rebellion. Um, you know, in, any, any rebellion like this, particularly an armed one against the legitimate authority, um, was technically a rebellion. Um, they sent what was known as the Olive Branch Petition to the King uh, in July, which was, uh, hey, let's simmer down, let's uh, tamp down everything and sit down and talk and resolve this. It was rejected uh, by, by the cabinet and the king. And so at that point, uh, it became very clear that the only pathway ultimately was to independence or breaking away completely from the uh, British Empire. So there's Thomas Jefferson. He was a Virginia planter. He idealized, uh, we'll call it the country life. Uh, yeoman farmer, he distrusted metropolitan cities. Uh, he supported the separation of church and state, uh, what were known as Republican virtues. Uh, he authored the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom, 1779. Uh, he was the principal drafter of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, he returned to Virginia, sat in the House of Delegates, was actually governor of Virginia, uh, minister of France in 1785 to 89. So interestingly enough, a lot of people assume he was at the uh, Constitutional Convention. He wasn't. He was uh, the minister to France or ambassador to France at the time, but very clearly a lot of his concept and ideas made their way into uh, not only the ideals of the Constitution, but particularly the, uh, the Bill of Rights that followed on. Very famous painting. Uh, there are, there's the committee. Uh, Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, um, I'm having a mental moment, uh, the gentleman from, New, from Connecticut and Robert Livingston from New York. They were the committee. Um, and they drafted the original uh, declaration. Jefferson actually wrote most of it. Um, a lot of it came from the Virginia uh, resolves, which had been written earlier. Uh, and there was a, a deadlock uh, because a lot of the delegates said, this is foolish to break away from the empire. Or what we need to do is negotiate an end to this and, and come to terms. And so there was not everybody was on board uh, just yet. And so it was decided that you needed to break the logjam by having a pretty firm declaration, uh, if you will. And that became the Virginia Declaration of 7 June 1776. And, and here's what it read. Resolved that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved. Uh, so that was the Virginia Declaration. And from that point on, for the next month or so, uh, the committee presented their drafts and it was voted on. Interestingly enough, uh, New York abstained. Uh, the New York legislature, remember that New York at the time was very heavily loyalist. And so it's really not a surprise that, um, that uh, New York would not be totally on board. But eventually, uh, 12 of the 13 colonies voted for the Declaration. Um, Congress uh, approved it 
and it was issued, I think it was actually uh, signed on the 2nd of July, and that's the copy you can see in the National Archives. It was promulgated or put out on the 4th of July, and that's why we use that date as uh, Independence Day. Uh, it was originally published as broadsheets, which basically a printer set up the type and just printed copy after copy after copy, and it was sent out all over the colonies. Uh, George Washington actually uh, gave copies to his officers, and it was to be read to all the troops. Um, a lot of what is in the Declaration comes right out of the Enlightenment period. Uh, a lot of it's drawn from the 1689 English uh, Declaration of Rights uh, that basically established the sovereignty of Parliament. Uh, a lot of it came out of the 18th century uh, French Enlightenment, for example, from Voltaire, the concepts of freedom of religion, of individual liberty, pre freedom of expression. You see a lot of that in the uh, First Amendment uh, to the Constitution. Montesquieu, uh, the, uh, I think he was from Switzerland, uh, separation and balance of powers. So that's why we have the three separate branches of government, checks and balances, separation and balance of powers. And from Rousseau, the idea of the general will, and that is that the, the will of the people is, is, is expressed in a representative elected assembly. And so that's the Declaration of Independence. Now this gentleman here, Thomas Paine, uh, published a pamphlet uh, called Common Sense in 1776, and it was basically an argument for why political independence. Uh, he was an interesting character, kind of a hothead. Uh, he was a radical, intellectual, political pamphleteer. He actually ran a tobacco shop in, in England and failed. Um, he emigrated to North America in 1774 to avoid debtor's prison. But he published Common Sense on the 10th of January, 1776. In three months, it sold 100,000 plus copies. Don't I wish all my books sold 100,000 plus copies? Nonetheless, think about this in the 18th century, 100,000 plus copies. What was different about his pamphlet? Typically, uh, political pamphlets, philosophical pamphlets in the period tend to be very esoteric, uh, very high-blown, if you will. I'm, I'm searching for the actual word here, somewhat pompous, actually. Um, and so very few people actually read them. However, what Thomas Paine did was he wrote it in very straightforward, very precise language that anyone that basically was literate could read and understand, and, and I, or, or just a listener, if you were listening to someone, read it. And so it had a tremendous impact. It fired that whole public debate uh, over independence. It probably didn't influence Congress as much, but uh, certainly it, it uh, influenced the, uh, the public. Now, what's very interesting is John Adams actually despised Thomas Paine. In fact, he called him a, get ready for this, quote, crapulous mass, end quote. Uh, didn't particularly care for the man. Um, Paine also penned the American Crisis, and I'm sure everyone has heard these lines. These are the times that try men's souls, the sunshine patriot, and I forget the rest of it, but you, you I'm sure, have heard that. Um, and he wrote that and published that in, in uh, late 1775, which was um, not, a, not a good period when apparently uh, things were going badly. All right, let me wrap up with Benedict Arnold and Canada. I mentioned earlier that George Washington detached an expedition under Generals Montgomery uh, and uh, Benedict Arnold. Uh, Arnold was a Connecticut businessman. He had great aspirations to be a great military leader, and in point of fact, he might well have been the most talented senior officer of either side in the war. Well, I think we all know his story. Uh, if not, I'll talk a little bit about it uh, uh, next time. But um, he was highly regarded. He was a brilliant commander. Uh, and so they, they sent an expedition to capture Quebec and Montreal. Well, they actually did capture Montreal, no sweat went up and tried to do a double envelopment of Quebec. Well, if you've been to Quebec, you know that it sits on a high plateau, if you will, overlooking the St. Lawrence River. And the French had built these magnificent fortifications, which you can still see today, uh, very difficult to besiege. And so a couple thousand pretty scraggly, worn out continental 
army troops are just not going to do much damage. So, and another problem is they, they took off in the autumn, and you can imagine going through this country, even today, this country in rural, what's rural Maine, in the middle of winter, uh, or at least um, uh, in an autumn. And they didn't actually get to Quebec until late November. So you can see that this expedition had very, very little chance of uh, succeeding. But it was the first uh, real initiative um, by the Continental Army to try to conduct aggressive uh, operations. Um, they did take Man Montreal, as I said, but once they got to Quebec City, uh, it pretty well ended. Uh, many of the troops were captured. General Montgomery was killed in action. Uh, Benedict Arnold was forced to retreat. Well, that is the Great Riot, uh, 1775 to 76, and uh, I tried to cover essentially the some of the major events that occurred politically and uh, and militarily, and I think that the takeaway from this is very clearly by 1776, you have the 13 colonies declaring political independence, uh, actually calling themselves independent states now. Uh, you have the, uh, the British having evacuated uh, Boston, uh, and they're going to come back, roaring back in force, which will be uh, a topic for our next session, uh, roaring back in force with the amphibious landing and uh, capture of New York City. Uh, in the summer and early autumn of 1776. Uh, so very clearly you have a, a real-life shooting war going on here, not just simply uh, a bunch of unhappy folks uh, rioting. Well, with that, Britta, I think uh, we can open up to any questions. Yep, um, we have a few questions already. Um, okay. If anyone has, thinks of anything else, they can put it in the chat and I'll read it out um, to Professor Carpenter and he'll answer for you. So the first question is, why did the British delay in moving to Breed Hill in Dorchester Heights prior to June 17th, since their reinforce, reinforcements came in May? Well, that, that's a good question. Uh, I, I, I would say what prompted them to finally do that was the fact that they woke up one morning and looked across and and the, the militiamen had stealing, stole a march on them and were already there. Uh, military operations, even something at that level, takes some planning. Uh, you needed the reinforcements uh, had to be integrated in. They had to be acclimated. Um, remember, this is uh, getting on towards the summer. Uh, they had come primarily from Ireland and from Great Britain. And even in June, it's a, it's a different climate. And so you're not going to land them immediately and start military operations. Also, remember, it would take anywhere from six weeks to maybe three or four months to transit across. And uh, by this time, by the time they arrive, these guys are in bad shape. Um, it, takes, it takes several weeks to, for, for troops arriving in the 18th century to, to really get back up to combat fitness. And so um, you're not going to launch a, an operation immediately. Uh, so what did they wait about? Three, three weeks, not quite three and a half weeks uh, when the, uh, the attack. But what prompted it actually there on that date in June uh, was they looked out across and realized that the, uh, the Patriots uh, had actually fortified breeds in Bunker Hill. All right. Um, another question is, why in the flag of Providence is there a British flag where the field of stars should be? Because... Uh, this field of stars here did not uh, emerge until 1776-77 uh, time frame, and this this was the original Union flag here. Uh, they just uh, added the stripes to represent the 13 colonies to the flag here. Interestingly enough, the flag of Hawaii, state flag, still has the Union Jack because the Sandwich Islands, named after our favorite card player, um, Hawaii, was known as the Sandwich Islands, and it was actually uh, part of the British Empire for a while. Um, so it, when they came up, a, a number of flags were generated. As you see some here, the Don't Tread on Me flag, uh, the Pine Tree flag, which I think came from New Hampshire. Uh, so different groups came up with different flags. I'm not sure who originated uh, the, the original Union flag here, but they just simply took that. Remember now, at the time that this flag was first used by the Continental Army, uh, they had not yet declared 
uh, independence. And so they still consider themselves part of the empire. Uh, it's not until the Declaration of Independence in the summer of 1776 where you actually will go over to this and eliminate the, the Union Jack. All right, another question um, from the onset from the British side, limited mm -hmm. war with limited objectives. What would have moved this to unlimited total war on the British side? Well, that was not going to happen because you were always worried about France and Spain, rightfully so. France came in in 1778, uh, Spain came in in 79, the Dutch came in 78, 80. Uh, you had an entire empire to defend. And so uh, everything that the British did all throughout the war always had to be with an eye towards defending the home islands, defending the West Indies colonies, uh, defending the, uh, the empire that was growing, uh, defending Canada. Um, so you're un if you go to unlimited objectives in the classic military sense, what you're talking about is overthrowing, um, overthrowing a regime or it could really go as far as complete genocide. I mean, th those are all unlimited. Initially, the objectives, policy objectives here would have been limited. End the rebellion, restore allegiance. Uh, I think you could make the argument that as time went by and once uh, the, the United States was declared, uh, you could say, yeah, it started going towards unlimited policy objectives because you, the idea was to overthrow the Continental Congress, restore allegiance. You could say that gradually over time uh, transitioned from limited policy objectives towards unlimited. As far as means uh, and resources, you're never going to get the British going to unlimited um, simply because they had too many other things to defend. And one of the big problems uh, that you're going to see after the French came in is now all of a sudden you have to defend, well, the French and the Spanish, you have to defend your West Indies possessions against both of those. Uh, you have to defend Gibraltar against the Spanish. You've got other things in the Mediterranean. You've got to defend your interests or growing interest in India, the subcontinent. The big thing was uh, defending the West Indies. And so uh, British commanders have always got to do a lot with a little. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why the Loyalist strategy in 1778-79 emerged. The idea being is, hey, we'll use what forces we can spare for a campaign in the South, relying heavily on loyalist support, loyalist turnout uh, to make up the difference and then establish uh, royal control, reestablish allegiance one colony at a time, starting from Georgia and moving up. And hey, if we only get back the South, so be it, because the South was the more economically uh, valuable. That's where you had the, uh, uh, the commodities like, uh, like rice and uh, uh, tobacco and uh, indigo. Uh, and naval stores, and you know, to hell with those stroppy New Englanders, let them go. Um, that was essentially the attitude there, because you could never devote unlimited resources. So I, I hope that answered that question, but um, yeah, I think that's pretty much the case. You start with a very limited, um, limited policy objectives, put down the rebellion, round up the leadership, and it all ends. But when it became obvious that it was much more that and growing, then it started going towards the more unlimited policy objectives, uh, probably by 1776-77. Hope that answered the question. All right, um, next up. Uh, we see on the tactical warfare side the effects of guerrilla warfare from the colonists. Was this formalized in the development of the operational art? It was, uh, I think it evolved out of necessity. The idea of irregular warfare uh, or petite guerre, as it was known in Europe, was not new. Uh, more often, though, European forces, uh, armies had uh, units specifically designated to conduct the what was known as the small war or what the guerrilla operations or the... Uh, the uh, irregular operations, for example, in the Austrian forces, they used a lot of folks from um, uh, the Balkans area, Croats, uh, Slovenes, those guys. Uh, 
and they were known as pandors. So uh, the idea of using those irregular forces to attack communications, to attack outposts, to uh, uh, harass convoys of supplies, that sort of thing, that was nothing new. I think out of necessity, because the Continental Army uh, was typically anywhere from a couple thousand, if not, if even that, at its low point, uh, up to maybe 16, 17,000 and spread all over the colonies, mainly concentrated as the war matured uh, in around New York with the main Continental Army. But there were forces, uh, forces everywhere. Um, so you just didn't have a whole lot of regular troops. Uh, for example, uh, typically in, in the Southern Campaign, you might have five, six, seven, eight hundred Continentals and a couple thousand militia. So the, you had to rely on the untrained, ill-disciplined militia for a lot of these actions to supplement your forces. And it, it, you're not going to ask an untrained militia, uh, despite what happened at, at Concord, uh, if you put them up against uh, regulars of any nation, particularly British regulars at the time, uh, they're going to get massacred. And so by default, I think a lot of these uh, groups then just defaulted to the irregular warfare, the hit and run, where they could uh, strike at a target that was vulnerable and then escape. Um, so it, I don't think it was initially something that was planned, like we're going to do this. I think it just evolved naturally. But clearly by 1780, 81, uh, in the South, at least, it was very clear that the concept of operations, in fact, was to use the irregulars or the partisans, they were called, uh, in conjunction with uh, regular uh, linear operations as conducted by the Continental Army. Uh, so I think that's a long answer to what's really a short, short answer. Uh, it was not originally part of the battle plan, if you will. It, it came about uh, of necessity. And then because it was successful, uh, it then became by late in the war part of Nathaniel Green especially uh, and Daniel Morgan uh, in the South became part of the battle plan. So uh, once again, the dynamics of war as it changed and it became a, uh, a global war, uh, much greater than just simply suppressing a rebellion, uh, you see it evolve and expand over time. Um, it's almost 8.30, so we're going to do one more question. Okay. Um, the area that became the state of Vermont, which wasn't at the Continental Congress, why did folks like Ethan Allen participate in the American Revolution? <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, there is some speculation that their major concern, meaning the Green Mountain Boys and Ethan Allen, they were more concerned with creating their own independent state of Vermont. And, and it wasn't until, I think, 1791 when they actually came in as a state. Uh, they wanted to break away from New York. Uh, and there is some historical speculation. There might even be some, some evidence. Uh, I'm not sure. But that that was the primary motivation of a lot of what are today Vermonters was they could have cared less about what happened in Virginia or South Carolina or even Massachusetts. They wanted their own independent state or in, even independent country. Um, but remember, it was part of New York, technically. And, and so anybody from Vermont that was in favor of independence would likely have wound up, say, in a, a New York Continental Regiment or what have you. But Vermont did not exist as a state until several years later. Do we have time for one more? Yeah, sure. Let's one see. more. I noticed in one of the early paintings, the regulars in the background wore hats, unlike unlike the lights gren grenadiers or mm -hmm. hat companies, tall, smooth, front brim. I thought this style did not come along until much later, i.e. the War of 1812. No, you're talking about that. Um, the that's a dragoon helmet that might be what you're talking about there um that was very typical uh a dragoon helmet it was made of leather reinforced you see that with chain and uh it had a crown here uh the idea of the crown there uh, and i'm pretty sure that 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 front plate the idea is when dragoons are attacking each other they uh 
have these bloody great dragoon swords or sabers slashing at each other, and that was to protect the head. You might be referring to you, the, patron, the, the light infantry right, right here. Earlier. Yeah, the, the light infantry helmet was similar, and you'll notice that their coats are cut short. Uh, the idea being that the lights uh, would go, if, a, if you had a marching formation, that the lights would be spread out as skirmishers uh, and scouts on either side. So if there was any enemy activity, someone trying to snipe at you or what have you, these guys would rouse them out. Well, they're going into undeveloped areas. The main body troops, the heavy infantry might be marching along a road. These guys had to operate in the woods. So they had to be uh, typically marksmen, better marksmen, and they had to be able to operate in the woods. The traditional cocked hat that you see here, um, I guarantee you five steps into the woods of North America, uh, you're going to lose your hat. It'll be knocked off by a branch. So the, the light infantry helmet, which again was constructed of leather, very similar to the Dragoon helmet, but it didn't typically have the crown. Uh, that's what you'd see on a lot of light infantry troops. If they didn't have these, if the unit did not have these leather helmets, um, and you saw this a lot uh, in the South, where regular what you call battalion companies, um, also known as hat companies. This, these are where you're you having infantry companies. Uh, they would cut down the uh, the brim of the hat, so it basically was a crown with a very small, um, what would you call it, uh, whatever that, that that comes out from the side. So it wouldn't be the the broad cocked hat. But I think that's that's probably what the question was referring to is the light uh, infantry. He said there. the patron um, said that it was an earlier picture from even that. That you were just showing. Um. Uh, well, if he's referring to this, remember this is <laughs> heroic art. It's not always accurate. Mm -hmm. That is the cocked hat style that emerged uh, in the so 1790s. He said you just passed it. <laughs> I'm not sure which one exactly he's referencing. Just passed it. I wonder if it'd be that one. Not this one, would it be? Chris, if you're still logged in, is it um, the picture that's on the screen right now? He said the one with the wall. That one? Yeah, he said there, so it must be this one. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I'm not really sure what, what you're no. saying. Okay, sorry about that. No, yeah, said, that's okay. You just had it two, slot, two slides, so maybe two slides either before this or after this. This one of uh, Northbridge? Or... Not that one. Probably talking about this one. And if, if that's the case, these they are representing uh, the light company of the uh, 10th Regiment of Foot. And you can tell that. You see their yellow facings. One interesting aspect of um, uh, the Army, musicians would have the facing color for the uniforms. It would just be reversed. Um, so if the facing colors of the 10th Regiment of Foot are yellow, their musicians would be yellow. But I think, I think he's talking about the light infantry helmet here, which did evolve. Uh, the light infantry uh, as a formal formation came about in 1770 in the British Army. Uh, and then um, in the uh, 1790, Sir John Moore uh, actually wrote up the regulations for the light infantry and, and uh, became much more formalized. But that's who these guys are. That would be the light infantry company of the 10th Regiment. Okay. Um, he was uh, yeah, here's an this might be what he's talking left, about. The yeah. Left of the yes. Oh, I see. I see what yep. he's talking about. Yep. 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 There you go. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Totally incorrect. But remember, heroic art uh, is not necessarily accurate. What that is is called the stovepipe hat, and that is basically War of 1812 period. Um, these were actually adopted in the British Army, probably about 1800 or thereabouts. Uh, then by 1815, they had a thing called the Belgique, um, which was very similar, uh, but this is called the stovepipe, and he's right. This is, this 
these guys here would have been more accurate for the probably the 1780s or so, 1770s, 80s. These guys clearly a War of 1812 period. So, yeah, I think that's what we were talking about. Okay. Okay. Um, well, I want to thank everyone again for coming. The next um, lecture, part three, will be on February 4th. Let's double check that. Yep, February 4th at 6 p.m. And um, part four will be on February 18th. Ask. Okay. Look forward to it. Thanks for everybody for attending and uh, appreciate it. And I'll see you in a couple weeks. Thank you, Stan. Have a good All night. All right. Take Bye. care. Okay. We're all done. Thank we'll you. See you, see you in February. <laughs> all righty. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.